we just got a couple of questions left uh, before we wrap up today, uh, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, so another one. This is one from Oxide, um, and is asking. <laughs> I love these uh, handles. <laughs> Uh, do all Gluckens aspire to work in finance and management positions, or do other others um, go for different careers? And uh, was the North Jersey Mafia an inspiration for Gluckens speech and behaviour? Uh, great question. So the Gluckens better aspire to C-level positions or management executive class permission uh, positions because that's what they were bred to do and that's what their mamas make sure they do so if a if a gluckin said um to his mom his queen uh you know i don't really want to pursue the family business of uh you know running these corporations for all these other types of families and stuff i just want to go out and start my little hippie leather, leather shop and uh, and i want to make aprons for people and and um, sandals um that would be really bad for that gluckin It'd be like, I raised you, I raised you to do a purpose, you know, and that purpose isn't, you know, you could just ima imagine the, the dragon mom uh, of elites and royals and things like that. It's kind of like you were bred to be a CEO and you want to be a janitor. No, no, no. You know, they might send you away to a uh, uh, <laughs> school to fix that in you. So Gluckins were born to run the companies of the really wealthy. Now, in the history of the tales that we've told so far, you, it, it kind of seems like, you know, Gluckin was, you know, Gluckin was just at the top of that food chain. No, eventually you find out they're like Abe, just on a whole nother level, in a whole behind more walls of secrecy from what the common folk understand versus how the elites would operate. And so, uh, in all of, in all of, of that, they are born for that job. And there's a couple of great books that have been written at different times. Um, there was one uh, a video, a documentary, I think it was called Thrive. And whether or not we believe it, but it was the heirs to a big, um, big corporation, heir to a big corporation, I think it was Procter & Gamble. And he goes, look, I was bred for this role and I'm telling you it's bad for you, right? And they're hiding this information from you. Whether or not you believe it, it's really interesting idea that there are certain people, we think they're on the top, but they're really just soldiers on another level working for the really powerful. And the really powerful, you, you might not have ever heard of, but you've heard of these ones that are working for them and you think they're the most powerful. So that's deep in the lore of Oddworld, in this, uh, you know, the hierarchy of um, where all that goes, but you would find renegade like Gluckins that just flew the coop. And then they're out there, you know, and maybe they have like a, you know, a, a roll your own cigarette uh, side, side stand somewhere like a taco stand, you know, I don't know, I just like being in the sunshine and, you know, so you're always going to find that um, we used to call them trust defiance, which is uh, you had a, you had a trust, <laughs> you inherited a trust so you could go around the world with dreadlocks and go to the ski resorts or chase the waves, or surf, whatever it is, you know, but you kind of had a good head start because you, you inherited a trust trust fund um and ski slopes and stuff i just remember people saying oh it's trust the farmers which is you, you were entitled to go off and do your own thing but the the gluckins yeah i would love to see uh the exploration of the gluckins that rebelled against the system and and in my makeup of of the choice of individuality and species is they all have a free will so you may be indoctrinated to do something, but you know, something may happen and you wish you could, you know, burn down the system, but you can't. So you just flee and then you open up a taco stand somewhere. <laughs> this story just told to me by a retired military guy. He goes, I just wanted a taco stand. And they were trying to give him like intelligence jobs and stuff like that. They're like, why do you want a taco stand? He goes, I love tacos. And I like, you know, serving people. And I, I think uh, uh, that's, what, that's what I want to do with my retirement. He had all this knowledge, but he just wanted a taco stand. So anyway, there you go. Cool. And the inspiration for their speech and behavior, can you talk to that? Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely uh, mafiosos. And um, coming from the Northeast, uh, it's not uncommon to actually, you know, incur no mafiosos. 
And, um, and it was something, it's something kind of hilarious about extremely dangerous people. And I don't mean to belittle uh, crimes or pains on other people or something like that, but on the, on the East Coast, uh, there was a lot of history with mafias. I had a stepfather that was from uh, Providence, Rhode Island. Anyone who knows the, the history of Providence, Rhode Island, and corruption and things like this. Um, the, and in New York, uh, is a, you know, New York's kind of infamously um, saturated with mafiosos in, in various levels. And I learned a lot of things, and I wound up meeting a number of people that were one of the things I found the most amazing later in life was when I meet some of these billionaires and I met a lot in, in my journeys. Um, I'd be like, man, they talk just like mafia. So <laughs> really, you know, everything in life is a negotiation. You know, like you, you couldn't tell. Is that the guy who just sold the, the banking uh, fund, you know, the investment fund, or is that the guy who's, at, who's running the after hours gambling joints? And I learned a lot of interesting things about, you know, organized crime with different groups and not from being a participant but just you know it's a small world and um and the mafiosos cracked me up because they were always like funny you know uh i know i know a guy recently he came out of mexico and um had to had to flee with cartel stuff and family being in police and that became a bad thing and it, it, all really terrible but part of this was his family and I was like, well, what was that? Like, he's like, you know, this is that. And it became a problem. So, you know, we left 15 years ago, whatever. And I said, so were they a lot of fun to party with? And he looks at me, he goes, so much fun. <laughs> and it was, it's kind of like uh, Goodfellas or something. You know, uh, if you saw that group in the corner of the room, they, they're the ones at the bar on a night, you know, they're the ones that look like they're having the most fun. And there was something about the twang of how they talked. And so in the case, uh, to answer directly, it wasn't Jersey. For me, it was more the Bronx and Providence. Uh, not that there's a Rhode Island or, or a Bostonian accent in there, but yeah. So it was definitely um, mafioso type influences for these characters. And then um, I just happened to know back in the 80s that someone would say, I got to go see the bosses like the big bosses. And you think, you know, maybe they're going to an area in Little Italy or something like that. No, they were going to the highest stories in the World Trade Center. Right? So it was like, wow, people think it's one thing. But then you find out the guys, and they start shitting their pants because they got to go report upstairs, but they seem like there was someone in the Bronx or Brooklyn or something like that. You know, so the neighborhood, they're like a Tony Soprano, right? But now Tony's got to go see the big people. And they're not living like the rest of the mafiosos. You can't distinguish them from the top earners of Wall Street. And that's who, you know, they'd have to report to someone at that level of society. And those people were, you know, much more big and powerful and scary. So without, you know, names and dates and shit like that, like I, I learned that that was real. And out of that, it was like, there, there was also something like um, a criminal class oftentimes has a way of developing another level of charm, you know, and maybe it's survival skills or something like that. But some of the most charming people you ever know, meet if you watch, uh, there's a UK YouTuber who uh, did time in the United States. He was the, the biggest uh, E, um, the E trafficker for ecstasy in the United States. And he was in the, um, he was in uh, prison in Arizona and now he has a huge podcast and all he does is interview pres uh, former people who've done time, mafia hitmen, mafia bosses, famous mafiosos. And if you ever watch his interviews with some of these mafiosos, one of the things is, um, and I'm not painting anything in a positive light, I'm just saying really charming, like really witty, really funny, really charming. And if you look at the mob bosses that would be on trial, uh, in New York City, so like through the 80s and 90s, the, 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 the courtroom is oftentimes just laughing with them because their answers are so fast, so witty and so funny and so kind of indifferent and casual that it's, it can be hilarious. And so I think Scorsese really plays off of that. Like you, and anytime you're portraying a bad guy, you're trying to find a thing that people will make that character appealing, that they actually like him. And then they are kind of like, damn, I like him, but he's really a bad guy. And that makes great bad guys. So yes, 
definitely inspired by mafias. Awesome. Really appreciate that insight. Um, I'll have to check out some of those uh, those videos in that podcast for sure. Oh, yeah. Uh,